Williams, Mathieu van der Poel starts race and doesn't win. Lorena Vibes sprints for victory and also doesn't win. It was all kicking off at Amstel Gold yesterday, so let's crack on with the GCN Racing News Show. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learnt that the annual Amstel Gold drinking competition has a brand new winner. I don't think Tom Pidcock likes beer particularly much. We also learnt that Mary Van Severen gives his all when he's racing a bike. He must have neck pain the day after a race. And finally, we learned that you should never, ever celebrate too early, particularly at one of the biggest races in the world. We must get some clear road ahead of her. Lorena Vivas with Voss challenging. Oh, did Mariana Voss steal it on the line? That was Lorena Vives celebrating what should have been one of the biggest victories of her already illustrious career. Her home classic. Uh, easily the most prestigious race in the Netherlands, and she threw it away by celebrating way too early. Now we see it time and time again, don't we? It's equally cringeworthy to watch every single time. You really got to feel for her, but at the same time, that was a mistake that you should never make, particularly when Mariana Voss is in the same group. So as you can tell, I'm starting with the Women's Amstel Gold Race this week, a race which was severely disrupted and changed due to an incident involving one of the police outriders ahead of the race. I uh, couldn't find an update this morning on the condition of those involved, but our thoughts are with them. Fingers crossed everybody is okay. Uh, it meant that the race was stopped for an hour whilst the organisers figured out how to plan it and reroute it. That ended up being a neutralised ride to Valkenburg and then two laps of the finishing circuit, reducing the overall distance of the race by around 60 kilometres. That dramatically changed things. I mean, without the accumulated fatigue that normally comes from the repeated climbs and efforts, more riders are in with a shot at winning, whilst other riders who need that fatigue to shine have less chance of making a difference at the end. Lidl Trek and Elisa Longo Borghini had a dig on the first ascent of the Kalberg, but the main move in the finale was a three rider breakaway. Baron Find of Canyon Sram, Castelline of Fenix de Koenig, and Evo and Act of Visma Lisa Bike. Uh, that looked like a really dangerous move at a point. Had more than a minute with 10 kilometers remaining, but it was eventually reeled in on the final ascent of the Kalberg after a frantic chase from Lidl Trek. Their aim, along with catching the break, was to launch Longo Borghini on that final climb. Uh, they came a little bit unstuck when Amanda Spratt became detached from her teammates at the start of the Kalberg in what was presumably meant to be a proper lead out to make the climb as hard as possible. Longo Borghini did have a dig, but it was Cassia Nubia Doma who made the biggest effort there. It was to no avail though. We didn't really have any separation amongst the favourites on that final climb, and it was soon clear that Lorena Vibes had made it over the top in the lead group. At that point, Demi Vollering took control, nullifying any attempts to go clear, and the final result looked like a foregone conclusion. We all know how fast Vibes is in a sprint. It was her race to lose. She came from quite a long way back, but made a couple of mistakes in the last 100 meters. So firstly, even though she sprinted down the left-hand side of the road, she opened up the door on her inside. At the same time, she was only looking to her right to survey the competition. And thirdly, obviously, she then celebrated too early, thinking that she'd got it. But she hadn't. Mariana Voss, who's having an incredible season thus far, snuck up the inside, sprinted all the way to the finish, where she made a full lunge for the line, and she'd pipped her. On the photo finish, it wasn't even all that close. We've certainly had closer ones in the last few years in the men's race. What was also lovely to see was the reaction of Ingvil Gascher on getting third, easily the best result of her career so far. The Norwegian rides for Jaco Alula, and like Fife for Georgie last week in Roubaix, it was just heartwarming to see how much it meant to her to be on the podium of such a big race. Great stuff. For Voss, well, it was her 251st career win in what is now her 19th year as a pro rider. She just never seems to make a mistake, does she? It's really quite incredible how good she is at every aspect of bike riding, but I think it's the tactics and general awareness that impresses me the most. Uh, it's only the 11th edition of the Amstel Gold women's race, and she's now the first rider to have won it twice in her career. On to the men's then, where there was one big favourite ahead of the start. So I was looking at the bookmaker's odds ahead of the race. 
Much of Vanderpool started at 2.2, whilst the second favourites were Tom Pidcock and Maxim Van Heels, who both started at 17s. So, all eyes on the world champion then. His team, Alperson de Kerning, certainly rode as though he still had the same legs from the last two weeks. Together with Ineos and a bit of help from Lidl Trek, they controlled the early breakaway, but what we didn't get was the long-range attack that we've been accustomed to seeing over the past few weeks. In fact, not a huge amount happened until around 60Ks to go on the Lurberg. Sudal quick steps Louis Vavaca made a move there. He was followed by Mikel Honoré of EF and Paul Lapera of Decathlon AG2R. It didn't look too threatening, but actually that move would have quite a bearing on the outcome of the race. Alperson continued to control behind, but were rapidly shrinking personnel. And so whilst the gap to the front three was never much more than 30 seconds, they weren't caught for a long time. Vavaka was dropped with 36 k's to go, and with the gap down to just 10 seconds at that point, it really felt like it was only a matter of time before the whole bunch caught the front two. But that's where things started to go wrong for Alperson. Van der Poel had run out of teammates there, and so there was nothing they could do to control the moves that soon came. Mark Hershey of UAE was the first to go, followed by Adria of Bora, Madwas of Groupama, and Mollema of Lidl Trek. Then you've got the likes of Jorgensen and Kron countering behind, and Bilbao. The race is chaos with no semblance of control, which is exactly what we've been missing at Flanders and Roubaix. Now, some of the TV directing left a bit to be desired because what we did see made it hard to know what was going on. Because suddenly, just before the Koitenberg, which is probably the hardest climb of the day, we see that Bernot and Pidcock have made it into the chase group. But there's no sign of Vanderpool, and we didn't see the peloton on that climb at all. Uh, we just had to go on the time gap that was on the graphic on the screen. I mean, it crossed my mind that Van der Poel might be bluffing or just playing it very cool, and that he'd suddenly smash it at any moment and bridge across, but it eventually became clear he just didn't have the legs to win on Sunday, which probably mucked up the races of a few other riders. I'm thinking of the likes of Schelmoser, Matthews, Kuznefoy, etc. They're all waiting for Alperson and Van der Poel to do something, but the ship has already sailed. Uh, so up front, Ineos are happy, they've got their leader up there. Group Armour are content as well, they're the only team with two riders. Bahrain have Bilbao, who's always canny and can often win. Ben Sevenant has made it across for Sudal Quickstep, so they're fine. But the teams that must have been frantically trying to decide what their tactics should be were EF, Decathlon and Lidl Trek. Uh, Honoré and La Pera, of course, have been out there since 60Ks to go. They're probably frazzled. Lidl have Mollema, but without a sprint, it's really unlikely he's going to win or maybe not even podium. I mean, they're not in as bad a situation as Israel Premier Tech or Jaco Alula, two big teams who missed it completely, but they must be panicking a little bit. And we saw that. EF put Healy and Carapaz on the front for Vandenberg, whilst Honoré was in no man's land between Group 1 and the peloton. And that was a strange one because he was lingering there so long, he obviously had enough left to do a couple of decent pulls on the front of the bunch. Anyway, on the Kalberg, Schelmose launches, and whilst he doesn't get separation, it does bring the gap down to one that looks like it's closable. But this is where it was really interesting. So every time it got close, someone at the front would put in a big dig and pull the gap out again. Uh, Bilbao did it on the descent after the Kalberg, but then Hershey attacks over the top of the next climb, pulling what turns out to be the race-winning move clear. Pidcock, Van Sevenant and Bernot follow it, and it's those four that decide the race between them. Hats off to Paul Lapera though. Not only did he not get dropped after getting caught, he almost rode from the second group across to the front group. He got agonizingly close, but just as he was about in touching distance, Pidcock made an attack. Whether that was tactical genius, knowing how fast Lapera is in a sprint, or whether it was just him trying to get clear in an opportune moment, I don't know. But had Pidcock not gone there, I firmly believe Lapera would have latched on and could have won that race. He'd have to settle for fifth in the end, winning the sprint from the second group, whilst at the front, Van Sevenen gave a lead out to the other riders. Now, to be fair to him, he looked like he just didn't want to finish worse than fourth. Pidcock's on his wheel, constantly checking over his shoulder, ready for the first person to start their sprint. Then as soon as Bernot kicks, Pidcock goes. He hugs the barrier, leaving Hershey hesitating as to which side to go on. As in the end, it was quite a comfortable victory, and one that must have felt like redemption for him after what he felt was a win here three years ago. I was going to say, uh, yeah, it's great to win for the second time, but that may, might be quite, create quite some controversy. You said it, Tom. Uh, he's talking about the photo finish there with Van Aert, of course, which at best seemed to be inconclusive as to who won that year. Remarkably, that's only Pidcock's fifth win on the road. He's such a huge talent, you just assume he's won more. 
Uh, they are big wins though. The outdoer stage of the Tour de France, Strada Bianca, Brabant's Appeal, and now Amstel Gold. He's also reigning Olympic and world mountain bike champion, of course. It certainly takes the pressure off him and Ineos going into Flesh Wallone on Wednesday and Liège Baston Liège this Sunday. They really needed that win, didn't they? I think Hershey and Bono will be relatively satisfied as well. They'll take confidence from that going into this week. Just before I move on, a reminder that you can get full race reports and reaction from all of the biggest races in the world over on our website, globalcyclingnetwork.com. You'll also find an article there that I wrote last week, uh, nothing to do with bike racing. I'm just trying to get a bit fitter and healthier, so check that out if you would like. Uh, on to some other races now, and I'm going to start with Brabant's Appeal, where Longo Borghini was in a class of her own last Wednesday. She got clear in the closing stages with Demi Vollering, but not even the Dutch champion could hold her wheel when she went on the Holsteader climb with just under 8Ks to go. Uh, she would never be seen again, so a win for her in that race. In the men's, we had a real action-packed finale. Moraine Vandenberg of EF attacked the front group with around 4Ks remaining, despite probably being the fastest finisher in there. Unfortunately for him, the beast, that is Joe Blackmore, was there to work for Israel Premier Tech teammate Dylan Turns. I've said it already a few times this season, but Blackmore is incredible. Uh, he'd take fifth place on the day, despite all the work he'd done in the closing stages, and then go on to win the under-23 Liège Baston Liège a few days later. Uh, unfortunately, Turns couldn't pull it off for the team, but it was nice to see Benoit Cousnefois finally take the win there after many years of coming close. He'd already been on the podium three times in four participations, but Wednesday was the first time that he'd been on the top step. Uh, we also had a series of French Cup races last Friday through to Sunday, uh, all three of which were won by Groupama FDJ, David Godou in a Lenny Martinez sandwich, if you'll forgive the image. Martinez won solo at the classic Grand Besançon Dube on Friday, ahead of Victor Langolotti of BH Burgos, and then again yesterday at the Tour de Dube in front of Clément Berthet. It was the Tour de Jura Cycliste that Godou won on Saturday. Uh, all three races were won by exactly four seconds, funnily enough. Uh, well, not that funny, but, well, I just thought it was worth mentioning, all right? Uh, meanwhile, at the Giro d'Abruzza in Italy, UAE somehow managed to lose the race overall. It really felt like it was theirs to lose, given that they had Adam Yates, Pavel Sivakov, Jan Christen and Diego Ulisi in their ranks, but they were all outgunned by Alexei Lutsenko of Astana. He's just on fire occasionally, isn't he? Uh, he won on top of the Prati di Tivo mountaintop finish in a time that was apparently quicker than today Pogaccia. He won a stage of Terreno there a couple of years back. Uh, Ulissi rode on the front for a lot of that climb, presumably in support of Yates, but when it came to the finish, the Brit had nothing left. Ulissi must have been a bit annoyed, actually, that he wasn't given a little bit more protection and freedom to be able to go for the stage win there himself. Other stages were won by Jan Christen, who became the latest teenager to win a pro-level bike race. I still find that incredible. Sivakov, who took his first win for UAE on stage four, the final stage. And Enrico Zanoncello, who won the opening stage bunt sprint for VF Group Bardiani's GSF Faisane. Just one last result. Uh, congratulations to Christopher Blevins and Jenny Risveds, who won the opening round of the UCI Mountain Bike World Series at the weekend in Maripura, Brazil. Right, thanks as ever for watching. I'll be back in a week's time to chat you through Flesh, Liège and the Tour of the Out, which is the first big build-up race to the Giro d'Italia. I'll see you then.